we um we record these sessions um to just capture the great wisdom and uh, knowledge that is shared. We don't break, we don't record the breakout room, so we do want to have these recordings for those that are not able to join us. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so back to our agenda um, and what I was saying, we know that funding is just such a key piece um, to keep things moving forward. And we know there are a variety of funding strategies um, from, from grants and bonds and all sorts of strategies. But when realistically, when it comes to systems change and, and district-wide programs, we really need to be thinking of like those long-term models and pushing for more sustainable funding models. And so with that, we are fortunate today to be joined by David Weinstein, um, who is TPL's Western Finance, Finance Director, um, Western Conservation Finance Director. And also we are joined by Troy Garner, who is Executive Director um, Planning, Design and Construction for Denver Public Schools. And they both have a wealth of information and a lot of success in leading bond measures, um, respectively in Oakland and in Denver. So really excited to hear um, from them. And then Depending on how that discussion goes, we will either go into small breakout rooms and then do a little report back and finally just close with some um, reminders and announcements. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to David. Um, I know we have a lot of people in here, so I can't see through, but hopefully you are on. Um, I am. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, David. So welcome. So happy you were able to join us. Thank you, Brenda and Priya. And I am keeping my computer muted because sometimes my internet goes unstable and uh, calling in here. Uh, so I hope everybody can hear me okay. Thank you all for uh, being here today and having me. And I'm excited to see a few TPL colleagues of mine uh, chiming in in the chat as well. Uh, as Brenda mentioned, I'm David Weinstein. I'm the Conservation Finance Director in the West for Trust for Public Land. And if you go to the next slide, if you're not familiar with TPL, uh, we're a national nonprofit organization that works to protect land and create parks for people to ensure healthy, livable communities for generations to come. And, you know, we really have, in the last few years, become a lot more strategic uh, per a, a 2020 strategic plan and have four uh, initiatives that we like to focus on, and those include um, community, health, equity, and climate. And then we've got a number of different commitments as well, one of which is community schoolyards. And I see that Danielle Denk is also on the call, who heads up all of our community schoolyards work and uh, is just a font of information and a great resource for follow-up questions in this part of the conversation. Um, so those are some stats uh, about who TPL is and what we do. But today, I really want to focus on that left column there. And if you move to the next slide, we created uh, the Conservation Finance Program about 26 years ago to help states and counties, municipalities, and districts generate the public funding they need for their conservation priorities. So TPL has worked hard over the years to act as technical advisors and support uh, in order to really reflect the will of the communities with which we work. Increasingly, we're seeing uh, just myriad co-benefits as they relate to both community schoolyards and parks and close to home recreation. And so uh, very excited to be with you today to talk about, uh, I wouldn't call it a pivot, I would call it a yes and as far as focusing our conservation finance work on schoolyards in particular and figuring out how to use the extensive experience that, that we have and some of the institutional funding that we have at our disposal to help um, communities across the country create more community schoolyards. You move on to the next slide. Um, the reason that we started this program so long ago, and I apologize that this is pretty conservation focused, um, and I will freely admit that it's just within the last few years that um, we started deploying my team um, into the community schoolyard place. But, uh, if you'll indulge a dubious analogy, I'd like to think of our team as like the eye of Sauron, right? That we can kind of shift uh, the chops that we have uh, and the focus we have on different aspects, not just conservation, but in a less malevolent way, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings and such. But So I don't see um, the numbers popping up in this pie graph, but down below, 
uh, what would normally be in there is that green slice is just the local level, and that is more than 50%. So uh, the takeaway from this kind of busy slide is that more than 50% of all conservation uh, funding in this country is generated, not just at the state level, but just at the county, municipal, and district levels, uh, which makes sense, right? We all um, vote sometimes multiple times a year on local measures, including school measures and school bonds, um, but also on conservation priorities, on climate priorities, um, and other recreation-oriented priorities uh, that generate a ton of funding, um, as opposed to some just over 20% at the federal level and uh, close to a third of the funding that's created at the state level. So that's why we started this program, uh, because it is really powerful to be working locally. And again, with a few key people within TPL, uh, we can have a broad impact on the country working with stakeholders uh, within municipalities, within school districts, uh, and, and anybody else that's passionate and engaged in this type of work. If you go on to the next slide, um, the biggest takeaway that I would like to leave you with today, if you in your communities are thinking about how to generate funding for community schoolyards, would be these three things. Um, I'll, I'll focus on the bottom there, elected leadership. This tends to be more appropriate in conversations with uh, county commissioners and mayors and city councilors, uh, or at the statewide level with state uh, legislators. Not as much with school board officials because, um, you know, we, we put this in here because having elected leaders and their bully pulpit shouting from the rooftops that conservation measures or schoolyard measures are a good idea is pretty critical. Uh, ostensibly, they're trusted <laughs> uh, officials within their communities and um, they, they hold a lot of clout. And again, it is that local level. Um, so it's, it's, they don't get wrapped up in kind of the national electoral politics and the, the vitriol that we've seen in the last couple of decades. Um, and so at best, we have elected leaders supporting this. And, you know, mostly school districts are going to be very supportive of creating funds for school districts. Uh, and at, at worst case, we want neutrality. When you start having elected officials speaking out against your public funding endeavors, that's when you start running into problems. Uh, the demonstrable need and or risk, uh, very critical when it comes to climate and parks and trails. And as you'll hear me talk about in the Oakland example at the end, uh, it's really important to understand if voters get what we're talking about when we talk about community schoolyards. Um, so I'll have more to say to that later, but you need to be able to sell this. Um, so what is that demonstrable need? What is the benefit or what's the risk if you don't? Uh, pass a measure. And then finally is that community support. I, I kind of touched on this already, but um, we have a limited team internally and uh, we really rely on all of you in your communities um, to, uh, to carry the water of a campaign and to be the local representative. So that's kind of the highest level. Now, how do we do this work? This gets into the nitty gritty and I'll try to keep this all quickly so that we can reserve the balance of time for conversation. Um, but this is how we operate. This is what we've honed in over the course of the last 26 years. Uh, and it really begins with community engagement and understanding from a school district priority, what are the needs? What's going on? Um, there are a ton of things that schools need to be thinking about when it comes to funding. Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to community schoolyards, uh, who could, who are the advocates? Who's talking to the school district? Who's talking to elected officials? And can we incorporate some of the things that we do at TPL? into a package that would be funded by the public. Uh, so community engagement is kind of lay of the land work. The feasibility research that we do, um, again, this will be a little bit of an asterisk mark because when it comes to conservation priorities, we're usually dealing with a number of different funding mechanisms that can fund this type of work. Um, you know, I live in Montana and we only have a few mechanisms at our disposal, largely property tax, income tax, uh, we don't have a sales tax uh, and then taking on debt through bonds. Uh, but then you go to California and you've got just myriad different types of funding mechanisms. So the feasibility research really looks at, A, what's the conservation priority within the community? Or in this case, what is the school district trying to accomplish? Uh, B, what do the demographics look like? Who are the voters? What is the geography? What's the history of this community? And then most importantly, the meat and potatoes of the report really does look at different funding mechanisms at different revenue generation levels. And we determine 
how much money that's going to cost the individual voter uh, to help inform what kind of uh, funding package we're looking at moving forward. From the feasibility, we move into public opinion surveys. Again, despite the, another admonition about electoral politics versus issue campaigns, uh, public opinion surveys continue to be very accurate when it comes to issues and measures like we're talking about here. Um, there's not a lot of uh, nefarious covert activities that we're starting to see on the elected official side of polling these days. And a, in a public opinion survey, you're probably all very familiar with polls, but we are trying to figure out how voters would, would respond the next day if an election was held, and then hit voters with a number of different questions. What is, are, are your priorities aligned with the school district? Uh, what is your tax tolerance for the package that a school district is talking about? What are the messages that are resonating uh, with you and your family as it relates to schools? And then maybe some conversations around messengers. So basically, we're just trying to figure out if there's a there there with these types of polls. From that, and we call out ballot language very specifically because we do know that you can have all the money at your disposal and you can run the best campaign in the world, but there is literally just one thing that we're going to be able to ensure that all voters see, and that is ballot language. So we always stay within state statute, uh, but we really like to push the bounds. We don't like uh, uh, communities to rely on rote um, you know, precedent when it comes to this thing. So we, we push the boundaries, stay legal. We've got in-house attorneys. We, we work with bond councils, uh, city and county attorneys, uh, and state attorneys all over the country uh, to make this as best as possible. Uh, I will skip the petition process versus referendum process because largely school districts are referring measures to the ballot and we're not dealing with citizen petitions, especially as it pertains to schools. And then finally, the last step in the process is kind of the one that the general public knows the most about, and that is campaign, uh, the campaigning process. And TPL has a lot, as I mentioned, of, of institutional dollars at our disposal. Uh, I can throw on a 501c4 hat. Um, and help communities campaign like I did in Oakland. And we can do everything from a soup to nuts campaign plan uh, and pull uh, stakeholders together throughout or in bigger jurisdictions with people that have more sophistication. And that's oftentimes school districts because they're frequently going to the ballot um, with, with public funding questions. Uh, I can just sit back and ask, act as a technical advisor for a campaign. So that's very quickly our, our process. And if you move on, um, I think we just have a history of the work that we've done. It's been enormously successful, as I mentioned at the top. Uh, we've helped states and local communities generate more than $93 billion in funding, um, which is really exciting. Uh, and you know, we, we now have a couple examples of how this can work with school districts, and we're really excited to do more of this work. Uh, so we'd love to connect with anyone after this kind of call uh, to talk about opportunities uh, where you're living. And real quick, I think I'm just gonna race through a case study in Oakland, and then I can hand it over to Troy. But um, on the next slide, uh, as, as Danielle and the, the TPL team knows quite well, um, we had our community schoolyards folks working within the jurisdiction for a number of years, frankly, before we even got close uh, to a conversation around public funding. And the, the critical component, component here, and I'm sorry the text is so small that I tried to highlight there on the right, is that we actually got what Oakland likes to call living schoolyards uh, uh, integrated into the master planning documents they had for the Oakland Unified School District. And that was that really unlocked so much. And that, you know, I, I don't want to understate how important all that on the ground work um, that, that our team was doing and that the school district was doing um, to come up with this really strong language and, uh, you know, a clear priority for the school district would be the creation of these types of community schoolyards. If you go to the next slide, um, so we, we went through the whole process that I just described. And when we got to the polling component, we found that um, the conservation priorities, schools, uh, community schoolyards didn't make it up into the top tier of the actual priorities. You know, we were asking questions in the poll that had to do with like earthquake safety, uh, ridding schools of mold, fixing leaky schools, making sure that um, earthquake standards were being met, you know, kind of some traditional needs that the school district had. 
Um, and it makes sense that parents were most concerned about like the safety of their children and a healthy environment in which uh, to enter. However, when we got to the messaging, as you can see here, um, if you look at that third benefit, these are the top tier messages. Um, you know, so you can see some of those re repairs and things that I was talking about at the top. Uh, as a reminder, we are uh, in the midst of pandemic, like pre-vaccinations and a lot of fear and confusion. So COVID was very much on parents' minds. Um, but that, that third bucket, health, uh, part of this bond will be used to transform paved schoolyards into green schoolyards, which featured trees, gardens, community design, recreational spaces. This is a, a message about lowering ambient temperatures at the schools throughout Oakland. This is a message about teaching kids about um, agricultural practices and uh, close to home food sources uh, and a place that, that both schools, both kids, uh, teachers, and ultimately community members might be able to recreate if uh, the school district is able to execute joint use agreements with municipalities throughout the school district, which is really exciting because Trust for Public Land really works hard on ensuring that all Americans have equitable access to parks and trails. And so if we can unlock community schoolyards um, in school districts throughout the country, that just, you know, I don't know what the numbers would be, but that offers a lot more close to home park space for community members. So with, you know, because we now know, uh, or at the time knew that uh, voters within the Unified School District of Oakland cared about this. If you go to the next slide, that gave me leave to work with the campaign. Uh, again, bring some of the dollars that we had at our disposal to the table. And we, uh, th this is a mailer that we created in both English and Spanish and sent out to, I think, 30 to 50,000 um, households throughout the Oakland Unified School District. And uh, all the messages were taken directly from the polling. Um, you know, things on the, in the yellow box have to do with those, those key conservation priorities. Um, that, that were top testing in the poll. And then on the left, we used all the messaging around community schoolyards and um, uh, what the benefit would be for kids and community members. So I'm sorry I'm talking qu so quickly. I know we're, we have limited time, but I think that brings me to the end of, of my presentation. And again, um, I'm hoping Brenda and, and Priya will, will send out my contact information uh, either on this webinar or afterward. I'd love to connect with you individually about what's going on in your neck of the woods and uh, figure out if we can have a conversation about how to generate more funding for this work in your community. Uh, we certainly will, David, <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much. Um, and no, no need on rushing. I will say I did. I don't know if he's been able to join. I did get a text um, just uh, before we started uh, with David with um, from Troy that some unfortunate events in Denver have pulled him over to um, some meetings he is trying to join, so he might join in the course of the next half an hour, but unsure at this moment. Um, with that, that we can continue um, this conversation before we get into breakout rooms. So I'd love to just open up the floor for any questions for David or anything that resonates with um, efforts that are going on in your local communities. And feel free to just go ahead and unmute yourself um, or, or do the, if you know how to operate the raised hand button, that might be a good option. But if not, go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead, Jaime, how are you? I'm doing great. David, thank you. That was a fantastic um, presentation. Very excited to connect with you after the call. Um, so very interested in this in Houston. Um, obviously, we are a very climate vulnerable place that has just, uh, you know, just been hammered by climate change already. We also are number 70th mm -hmm. on your park score list. Um, so I guess my question to you is, um, what has additional funding from the federal government um, includes in, in terms of EJ, climate adaptation, things like that? Has that changed the, the game in terms of potential synchrony with local elected officials? Have they been more likely to buy off on these sorts of transformations because of that? Um, or is that that's not filtered down yet? It's starting to, it's a great question. Um, and ironically or perversely, whatever the word might be, depending on individual elected officials' reactions to the amount of money that moved to the federal system in the course of the last two years, we have seen certain communities pull back 
on various conservation uh, funding efforts because they're like, we're flush in cash. We, we really don't need to be asking our voters for any more money right now. Um, I can't speak necessarily to the schoolyard component of how that's uh, hitting the ground throughout the country. I don't know if Danielle might be able to weigh in on that or not. Um, but on the other side of that coin, uh, we're, we're finding that uh, communities are able to use, you know, whether it's the, the Rescue and Recovery Act funding uh, from COVID days in particular, or the infrastructure bill um, and others that they are able to fund, uh, they're kind of able to top off their general funds, uh, which gives them more discretion to be focused on special taxes or dedicated taxes uh, that relate to things like community schoolyards. And of course, we, we're, we're always working to create these programs and packages with as much lever leverage potential as possible. And obviously the feds are always looking for leverage. Um, so we can connect a lot of those dots in a lot of different instances. Um, I mean, I'd love to connect with you offline, but I'd love to give, open it up to any of my TPL colleagues that might also have something to speak, say about that. Well, David, excellent presentation. Thank you so much um, for sharing your experience with conservation finance in Oakland in particular. I do hope we hear from folks who are interested in taking this to your community. And uh, I just wanted to add that if there is interest in working with TPL and conservation finance efforts and with David and his expertise, um, I might have some funding at, you know, to support that effort as it can take your school year program further, um, if it's in a high need community that is. Um, in terms of the funding question um, that you raised, um, we are certainly seeing, you know, ESSER being allocated to schoolyards, but a lot of the new buckets of, of dollars that are available are not necessarily supportive of projects that are just in the early phases. And, and given the kind of the fact that so many schoolyard programs are relatively new, they might not have shovel ready projects. And so there's a little bit of, of kind of mechanizing that needs to happen, but I think there's going to be a real quick turnaround point, maybe in a year from now, where that money starts to really come in and support schoolyard greening at a much greater scale. Great question. Liz, um, you, you had a question, go ahead. Yeah, I actually have two ones too, and hopefully they're short enough. So I wanted to ask if size of community matters. I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona, and we're smaller communities than say Oakland or New York. And But the uh, other thing I wanted to add is we just did a bond um, it, that included climate change and um, an opportunity to uh, work on a green schoolyards uh, through one of our, through Camp Colton, which is a camp we have as part of uh, supporting student learning in nature. And of course we have a bond cycle. So I would like to hear about the impact of size and also how far out ahead we should ask you in depending on when our next bonding opportunity will occur. Cause I'm totally thinking about this as a way to Thanks, move Liz. Thanks. Yeah. Great questions. I will actually be in Flagstaff tomorrow. I, I don't know if I'll have time to meet up, but uh, look forward to look forward to being there. Um, so, great question. Obviously, jurisdiction size can matter. Um, it can matter insofar as a tax base is concerned. I've worked in communities as small as like Springdale, Utah. You know, the Gateway to Zion National Park, um, and it's extremely difficult to to field a, a public opinion survey there because it's hard to, there are just so few people there. It's, it's hard to track them down for questions. Um, and then also it really can limit the amount of funding at your disposal based on the size of your community, right? Just because of a broad, broad tax base needs. Um, and the fact that there are so many other services that elected officials are also thinking about all the time. Um, however, Liz, um, all that said, you know, these measures pass uh, you know, I, I'm trying to, I could roll through a number of different examples, but like the New York state just passed a climate resiliency uh, package last legislative session uh, to the tune of four or five billion dollars. Um, and then we're working in towns as small as Springdale to help them achieve their goals to, uh, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, it only really matters insofar as how much money you're able to generate. Uh, and what kind of com competing priorities uh, might be out there. But uh, that's one reason we do this feasibility. That's one reason we have this arc 
um, of a process so that we can do the feasibility research to understand the demography of the area, uh, current budgets, what types of interests are already being funded by separate or dedicated taxes, and what's being left to general funding, and what school bonds uh, and school districts are dealing with, um, and then move on to the public opinion research so that we can understand how voters are thinking about all those different priorities. And that gives us thought, again, wrong phrase, you'll have to forgive me for all my bad analogies today, but like the plausible deniability to go back to your elected officials and say, hey, the voters care about this, uh, tax tolerance is, is lined up. I know that you're dealing with public safety issues and parks and trails issues and prison issues and transportation issues, but uh, this is what your community is asking for and they're willing to pay for it and they're prioritizing it. So we really do work on sussing all that information out um, uh, throughout the process, Liz. And again, would love to connect with you offline about what's cooking in Flagstaff. Brenda, I'm thinking, um, I think we should definitely keep going with questions. And I know you're kind of mining those. And I see a couple in the chat. Um, if there is a lull, and if it looks like Troy is not able to join us, um, I'm happy to kind of share highlights from our call with him just to put that other case study on the map here. Um, but while we have David, and, and you all should know, David graciously agreed to do this like moments before he sets off on a grand adventure, a rafting adventure. So we are standing between him and his vacation. So we want to make the best use of his time too. <laughs> no worries about that. Thank you, Priya. Yes, um, we have a we have one more question. And yeah, we should just keep them coming um, in this broader room for now. Uh, from Ram in New York. Um, so who is active from upstate New York around Rochester schools to pursue these initiatives? Um, maybe just the networking question. We we have a program in New York City and um, and also uh, ability to um, support work within the state. So um, please reach out um, to me. I'll put my email in the chat and you can um, we can talk more. I can introduce you to our New York State director. And Ram, just so you know, like a number, a number of the folks on this call themselves are the school district and city <laughs> embedded teams who would be, if they're fortunate, working with a partner like TPL who can really bring so much strategy and good thinking and um, practice into this. And um, I'm delighted to see that Troy just joined as well. Um, and so in this case, um, we hopefully can can hear from him um, more about his, directly his work, you know, from within the school district. Welcome, Troy. Can you hear us? I can. Um, we know you've had a really rough um, couple of days there. And um, just before you <laughs> come into the space, just want to say our hearts are with you and your community right now. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Brenda. Um, no, I was just uh, we Troy. We just finished hearing from from David, and we would love to hear um, a little bit about the efforts on bond funding. This measures we talked about yesterday um, on the phone on just your success with with Denver Public Schools and. She, instead of going into breakout rooms, I think at this point, just sharing here with the broader group would be would be great. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, great to see everyone here. Um, so in Denver, uh, we had a schoolyard initiative that began roughly around 1999. And back then, um, it was about getting grassroots efforts going in our communities. And at the time, we launched what we call a public-private entrepreneurial partnership, where we were getting uh, donations, as well as working with our local city agency, um, as well as Denver Public Schools facilities, was able to provide some funding for us to build out our first 22 schools that was prior to any uh, passing of bonds to support the work. And we targeted our underserved communities, um, and that helped build the ground 
uh, for this work. Uh, I'm through uh, success with our partnerships. Uh, we found that our schools, everyone across the city was like, hey, putting their hands up saying, when are we getting our new playground? Because our playgrounds in the past were nothing but pea gravel and old steel equipment that faced to the south. So that anytime you slid down those slides in the summertime, uh, you came out with some uh, burn scars on your skin. So um, thanks to that effort of the original 22 uh, in 2003, uh, we passed the bond and don't quote me on these numbers. I wanna say we had 64 uh, schoolyards that needed an update. And uh, in 2003, we put half of those on our bond measure. Um, and thanks to Denver voters that passed, we were able to build out those 32. And then in 2008, uh, five years later, we went for another bond to complete the program. And so by 2012, all of our playgrounds had been updated from pea gravel and steel equipment um, to lush uh, green areas of play uh, with nice colorful playground equipment uh, with four age appropriate play pits. And that has proven successful for us as modeling, uh, especially as we think about our new schools. Any questions on that? I know that was a quick history uh, lesson there. Can I can I put one question to you, Troy, that came Absolutely. up? Folks were, you know, after David was speaking, were like, where can we find a partner like this? And I, I remember you saying something like that when we spoke before, just you were saying, find yourself a Lois, find a a local partner champion who's getting some of that work underway so people can really see and envision the type of transformation you're talking about. Can you talk about what that looked like in Denver to have that local partner? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure if you all are aware of uh, Professor Lois Brink. Uh, she worked at the University of Colorado Denver uh, here. And she was actually, we call her the godmother of our playgrounds. She's the one who approached the district with this vision on how we can improve um, our schoolyards and make them better for our underserved communities as well as all our communities. And it was thanks with, to, to her visioning, partnering with DPS, uh, we built out master plans for all our schools, uh, brought in local community members. Uh, we also teamed up with a company called Kaboom in the early years. And they were able to provide us some playground equipment and we had community build days uh, when we found out in the early years when we didn't have enough money to fund the uh, art of the excuse me the natural turf um, we would put the irrigation systems in and would have a field laying party um, with the community that surrounded the uh, schools uh, just to get that community buy-in and support it was important to us to make sure that the community had um, uh, some skin in the game and was interested in building out this place because we also want to make sure that the, everyone would have eyes on the playground and uh, work to maintain it and keep it in uh, the best condition as possible. Because I'm sure like many of the other school systems that are on the district, we've got a whole lot of needs and just a small amount of money. And so we do everything we can to leverage partnerships as best we can to uh, make these improvements happen. Does that answer your question, Priya? Yeah, that's great. Yes, if you do not have a Lois Brink, find a Lois Brink, someone who's really excited about the work, who lives and breathes it, and I'll truly help uh, get that the excitement and that groundswell built up to support the effort. Any other questions I can answer? Yeah, any other questions or, or just thoughts, um, reflection on what's been shared so far? or even what's going on in your own community, questions that you know this group might support with an answer or advice. I'm happy to lob one more in here because um, one other piece that came up um, right before you joined Troy was um, just about open access and um, I think I remember you saying that in Denver, you were, I, I can't remember the number, it was something like 60% of the residents at the time, did, you know, did not have school age children, but the piece that there was a feeling that one of the reasons the bond measure was so successful was that this idea of open access to the community was a real selling point that 
people were, were not seeing this just as like, oh, we're investing in the schools and that's a good thing to do. But it was also about, you no, know, these are like the neighborhood spaces we are also going to access and use. Is that, am I, am I representing that right? And what was that dynamic like? You are representing that um, accurately. Uh, here in Denver, uh, our community uh, likes to partner with us and um, they wanna make sure that our school yards, our school buildings are accessible uh, when school is not in session. And as a good partner with our community, we make sure that that's available. Um, so after we greened all our playgrounds, uh, we do not lock them up. Uh, we keep them open so that the community community can take advantage of the spaces uh, after hours as well as on the weekends. Uh, we've got great partnerships here in Denver. We've got 300 plus days of sunshine. Not trying to sound like the Metro Chamber of Commerce, but uh, we love our weather out here and um, people love being outside. And so uh, it's important for us to make sure that uh, we've got some spaces that our community can take advantage of. And it did help us pass uh, some bonds we'd like to believe uh, a lot of our bonds have been focused on a lot of uh, infrastructure needs, boilers and roofs, um, and that's usually not the, the, the sexy project. And so when we were able to offer up new playgrounds uh, across the country, or excuse me, across our city, uh, that got people excited and they wanted to see and uh, learn more about the, what it is we've been doing. And thankfully, um, through the work, we've also uh, had some opportunities to partner with the uh, city and county of Denver and they've kind of based their model. I won't say it's completely off the model that we did, um, but they started upgrading their parks and rec uh, parks spaces to look similar or have similar components uh, that we built out into our playground. So we'd like to believe we were out in the front uh, pushing this effort. And for those of you, um, I'm not sure, again, how much you guys covered before I was able to jump on. I am going to put here in the chat uh, a link um, to uh, what our professor Lois Brink established as a um, area, a depository of all the work with the learning landscapes that have been done. It'll show you, I believe there's some pictures in there as well as some uh, plans on what our playgrounds look like. Um, so if you get a chance, please peruse through there. And if uh, you have any questions, by all means, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get you any answer you're looking for as long as I have it. Uh, Troy, thank you. We have a question from Melody. I believe it's for you. Is that a school district policy or a form of joint use agreement with the city? So we had a couple of schools um, that uh, are um, back to back with parks. And sometimes we did not have enough space on our property line. And so we had to reach a, a partnership, establish a partnership with the city and county to say, hey, we can build out this awesome play space if you can allow us to build some, uh, some of our playground components on your uh, play area. And it helps serve both a Denver Parks and Rec um, opportunity as well as it provides opportunities for us to make sure that our students uh, have uh, perfect places to play. Any other questions? There's got to be more questions. Hmm. Do I have to put my teacher hat on and call people out? Cynthia, I see you nodding. Are there any questions I can answer for you? <laughs> Melody, why don't you come off mute? You're asking good questions here. And it's nice to hear other voices besides ours. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. So I'm in Austin um, and we, I'm with the Parks Department and we have a joint use agreement with our school district, but it's only for um, 21 sites. And so I'm really interested in, in learning more about how you have open access at all of your campuses. I'd love to see that happen here. Um, our school district is hesitant um, to do that. Um, I think our parks department is is more than willing because um, it helps meet our park goals. But um, in terms of those spaces, especially is we also have a lot of adjacent sites, the way you're talking about where a school is directly next to a park. And we see the same thing happen where um, a school is using that park that's next door because they often don't have the features that are in that space. Um, and we have seen a lot of friction in those spaces and a lot of confusion um, around access um, and maintenance and 
safety, I think, especially right now. And so the the areas that are open to the public, I'm curious at, at what type of um, fencing or security you have um, in that space. And then for public use, what those like hours of operation are and who is the public going to if there's a, um, you know, a concern on that green space during out of school hours? Sorry, Great that was a lot. <laughs> Um, I will say in the early years when we had our public private entrepreneurial partnerships, uh, we were thankful that we had Mayor um, Webb at the time, as well as Mayor Hickenlooper get behind and support this effort. So that helped bridge the partnership and, and uh, working together um, to build out these spaces. In terms of our school sites, um, we've got the, your typical fencing. Uh, that is on the perimeter of the site. We just don't keep the gates locked. And so after hours, our community understands when school's out and they're able to take advantage of those green spaces uh, during the off hours. We have a, go ahead, uh, Chandi. We have a question from Chandi. Hi, Trey. I'm Chandi Aldina Somerville. I'm actually in our Denver office with the Trust for Public Land as our community school yards director and uh, very familiar with the learning landscapes. Lois is one of my professors in grad school. So lots of good connections there. But um, I did have a question about the bond funding. And uh, I know that it, it funded the build out of all of these schoolyards. Did you also have a maintenance funding component built into that bond? Or how does that work with how the bond was structured? And then now looking you know, 20 plus years later, at your schoolyards, what is your kind of view into the future of these learning landscapes? Great question. Uh, so in the early years, uh, we did some forecasting working with Lois and team to identify how many more dollars we needed to provide our grounds department to keep the learning landscapes looking as new um, as they could for as long as possible. Uh, that funding over the years has kind of, it used to be kind of a standalone pot in our grounds department, and now it's just part of their comprehensive budget, and they're responsible for upkeeping our playgrounds. Um, I will say um, some of the things that we are now looking at and making sure that there's additional dollars for, or there's a lot of intricate paint on some of our asphalt playgrounds, and so we're working now to think through how can we bring those back and freshen those up. Um, just because there's so many needs across our system we're, we're having outside of our playground upgrades, just some asphalt and concrete areas that we need to address. And so sometimes that is the priority over ensuring that we've updated the paint on the asphalt. Um, delicate balance, but we're doing everything we can to keep everything looking as fresh as possible for as long as possible. Thank you. You know, I might... Go ahead. Nice to meet you, Troy. I'm, I'm, I'm David Weinstein. I, I used to work in the Denver office along with Chandi and actually helped uh, John Hickenlooper move from mayor to governor uh, a long time ago. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I uh, you know some some famous and, and well-trodden words. I'm not an attorney, so I'll start with that hedge. But, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming but don't really know that, you know, per the terms of joint use agreements, I'd be curious to hear from others that, that have dealt with them. Um, if some of the O&M funding that is generated for parks and rec departments at municipal levels might be able to spill over into school districts if there are joint use agreements in place. Uh, we worked very hard with a number of stakeholders in Denver in 2018 and then again in 2020 to uh, increase sales taxes there. In 18, it was um, a quarter cent for parks and trails for, for the Denver system. Uh, which now generates 40 to 45 million dollars a year in a perpetuity and then a sales tax in 2020 for climate purposes uh, at the same amount. So, um, Chandi, it's a great question. And uh, schools, we typically talk about bonds when it comes to schools because there are so many capital needs that schools have. But obviously, there are a ton of, of operations needs and maintenance needs. And uh, typically, the IRS exempts debt from being used for those types of purposes. So. Um, you know, it's, it's always interesting to see how schools are doing the work that they need to do uh, with the funding mechanisms at their disposal. Uh, and again, we would love to research more on behalf of anybody here um, what we might be able to do in the O&M space.
We have another question from, um, yes, Melody, I'll get that too in a little bit um, on the Denver tour that we are doing with this, the, the conference. But before we have another question from Tara Buckner, is Denver's agreement between parks and schools solely about green schoolyards or is it part of a larger agreement? I'm unable to answer all of our agreements um, with the city. And we've just had a few schools that required the partnership to build out our play spaces. Um, but I also know we have other MOUs in place uh, with the city and county and Denver Parks and Rec. I'm just not able to speak to all of those agreements at this time. Does that answer your question? Liz, do you still have a question or is your hand up from before? You do have a question. <laughs> just checking. Um, yeah, I have a quick question about um, whether or not, Troy, you have any sort of like um, camp or green space that's unique that is used by your school districts. We, we have one here in Flagstaff called Camp Colton, and it's we're thinking of ways to incorporate it in our planning process. And it's going to it, it is just going to be a modernized thanks to our new bond issue that was just just passed. So we have a successful example of bringing a, a green space forward. And so now we're thinking about how in the next bonding cycle, we could go in for support for the schoolyards because we're actually building some new schools here in Flagstaff as well. So I'm always looking for examples of other cities who have done that. So if you could tell me about that, I would love it. Thank you. Thank you for the question and congratulations on your bond. Um, for us and working with Lois, one of the things that we work very hard is to make sure that each of our schoolyards looked a little bit different. Um, so they're, they're almost like a thumbprint. You will recognize the components, but if you go from one schoolyard to the next, they look very different um, based on the size of the, the property available, um, from small, medium sized uh, schools, uh, our gateways, our shade structures, um, the learning features that have been built into the playgrounds, uh, the gardening areas. It's all about the community involvement because when we were going through the design, we heard from our communities, what's important to you about a play space? How, what do you want your learning elements to look like as we design these areas? So we don't have just one big like Disneyland, uh, we like to believe we have 100 plus uh, smaller Disney worlds. Go ahead, Jaime. Oh. All right, uh, this question is for both of you and thank you very much for being here today. Um, I know you're both uh, dealing with things outside of this uh, presentation. Um, I guess my question is, um, we all live in different places. Some places have school districts that are part of the city and some don't. We we have independent school districts here that are not part of the city. And we also have a separate flood control agency that is part of the county, but not part of the city. And so it's jurisdictionally uh, um, difficult. They don't always work together. Um, so what advice would you give um, if you're in that situation where you have these multi-jurisdictional folks that might all have interests in a space and activating that space for climate, for park space, that kind of thing uh, that you've seen that that maybe is a rallying cry to get people across different jurisdictions to work together. Troy, do you want to start? Or do you want me to take a crack? Go ahead. I've got some ideas, but please, by all means. All right. Uh, first off, Godspeed. It's a difficult process. Um, at least it can be. Uh, everybody's got their own pie that they're very protective of. Um, everybody's got community goals in mind, but it just gets so much more real when you're looking at budgets and uh, figuring out IGA agreements and things like that. Um, one thing that we have found to be pretty effective, A, is you know, we, we facilitate a ton of communication between public officials all the time, whether it's at the elected level or staff. Um, so early and frequent communication to for just basic trust building exercises is extremely important. Um, but I also like, as I said at the top, 
the fact that parks or schoolyards can be uh, spaces of so many co-benefits, uh, that really does lead to robust coalition work. Um, so when we're thinking about campaigns, at least, not necessarily the question you asked, we're thinking about defensible spaces. We're thinking about climate mitigation, climate you know, disaster effect mitigation. We're thinking about close to home recreation. We're thinking about school stuff. As you start thinking about all these different priorities and as you start fielding public opinion surveys and get some statistically valid data, you can really broaden a coalition and bring that team to the table uh, to also help facilitate conversations between different jurisdictions. And again, the power, you know, for sorry to sound, I don't know what the word is, trite, but the power of democracy in that sense is really important to a lot of these people. And if you can, if you can show up with a number of different interest groups, not just your own, um, that all care about the same things, that really does get uh, electeds and staff onto the same page. I share uh, David's thoughts there. I think also here in Denver, there's a big focus on sustainability. Um, our school board has a past and ends policy where we are going to put a focus on uh, sustainable efforts. Um, and as we think through what that looks like, right now we have some old um, practice football fields that have natural turf. Um, and right now we are working to convert those to artificial turf because the amount of water that we can save by that conversion uh, is going to help with those environmental impacts. We know planting trees in the city helps cool down the city. Um, and so again, those are environmental impacts. And then we just know the impact of um, physical activity for kids and what the research says and how that impacts uh, how they perform in the classroom. And so those are three other areas you might consider exploring as you build out your program and the uh, impacts it could have on the community. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for those great questions. I know that we can keep on going, but um, I am looking at the time and there are a few other things that we want to quickly skim through before I hand it over to my colleague, Danielle, um, to talk about the next meeting. Um, just quickly with you, I just wanted to share our, at the Children and Nature Network, our conference registration is open. If I can share my screen quickly. Um, we have, this year, we're hold, holding our conference at Estes Park in Colorado. Uh, Troy, very excited to see the, the work in Denver because we are hosting um, the day before on or June 12th on Monday, we will be hosting a Denver Green Schoolyards tour. So for anyone joining us or planning on joining us, we invite you. It's part of the schedule. The schedule is already out on our website and it'll be the, the morning of Monday, June 12th, visiting um, three sites in the Denver area and one in Boulder. So um, really excited for that. If you have any questions about that or logistics or anything, please reach out to me or Priya. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Danielle to close us off for today. Oh, Can I put in a plug for your too, Danielle, too? Danielle is going to be at this conference presenting mm -hmm. on TPL Schoolyard's work um, with Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that's another huge draw. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, it's it's a wonderful yeah. conference. It's a wonderful conference. Uh, everyone should try to make uh, time to go. Uh, a lot of um, this great camaraderie. I am looking forward to it, and thank you all for hosting. Um, so for our next session, it will be on the 18th of May at three o'clock, um, same time, third Thursday, um, at, at three o'clock Eastern. So adjusting accordingly. And I wanted to just get a sense from everybody what topics would be helpful to cover. There's a lot that we can all talk about together, but um, the knowledge in the room um, and given the timing, was wondering if folks would rather have a conversation about state policy best practices and how to enable change across the state or uh, the new federal funding, take a deeper dive into the different funds that are available. Um, there's many um, because of the new administration and, and things that are coming out. So if you could, and, and people already are in the chat, either putting one or two, Based on my question, that would be really helpful. We'll put together a great session, as we always try to do for everybody um, for May. Seeing a lot of interest in federal funding. I'm not surprised. <laughs> all right, all right. It looks like that is the decider. Let's skip on the state policy for now. Okay, so federal funding it will be. Thank you all.
Thank you. And, and a big, I know David had to drop off, but Troy, thank you so much for, for joining us. We know we pulled you away from important um, stuff happening in your town. So thank you.